Let's first examine the case in which the collision is elastic. Now in the case of an elastic collision, then the velocity on the object that's initially at rest, so we'll call it v sub 2 since it represents the speed of block 2, is equal to this formula. It's equal to two times the object two, two times the mass of object 1, so the block that is already in motion before the collision, divided by the sum of both objects' masses, m1 plus m sub 2, times the initial velocity of block 1. Initial meaning the velocity of block 1 immediately before the collision, so v sub 1i. This formula can be derived from the law of conservation of momentum for elastic collisions specifically. It's not too hard to derive, but since this specific formula is given by the textbook and most physics textbooks, it's, pr it's a pretty good starting point. Now the problem tells us that the mass of block 2, m sub 2, is equal to 2 times the mass on block 1. Therefore, one way to simplify this a little bit is to take our original equation, like this, and then plug in 2m1 for m sub 2. The terms in the denominator will then add together to make 3m1, and now that we have a single m1 in both the numerator and the denominator, both of them can cancel out because they divide themselves by each other. We should also note that the initial velocity on the block, on block 1, immediately before the collision, isn't given to us by the problem. We are told that the block starts off at rest at the top of the ramp, but we know that's of course going to be accelerating as it moves down the ramp, and then we'll move at some speed along this flat surface here just before the collision. So we want to find that speed in order for this formula here to really be useful to us. Since the problem notes that the surface of the ramp is frictionless, then that means that as the block slides down this ramp, there is no force hindering its downward motion, other than a normal force when it reaches the flat surface here. But on the ramp, it is effectively moving down at, as though it were moving in free fall. So to find a better expression for this block's uh, speed, we can use our kinematics formulas to get it. I'm going to use the v-squared kinematics equation because it relates the final speed of the object with the height through which it falls. Since the block starts out at rest at the top of the ramp, this initial speed term can be completely ignored, and then we can take the square root of both sides to solve for v, and we can see that the block's speed shortly before the collision is equal to the square root of 2 times g, the acceleration due to gravity, times h, which is a given value, the height of the ramp. Now we can plug this in for uh, the initial, for v1i here. And now we have a speed for block 2 immediately after the collision, meaning now we know what its speed will be right before it heads over this friction surface and starts slowing down. But now we need to find, we still need to find the distance that it'll take before the block slows down completely. This right here, 1 half mv squared, is the formula for an object's kinetic energy. I'm going to use work and energy concepts to find the distance that the block travels because, after all, work, or a change in energy, is proportional to the distance that an object travels as a force is being exerted on it. So that will be what we want to use to help us find the distance that this block will travel. So if this expression right here represents the total kinetic energy within the block, then that means that the amount of work we want to do on the block is equal to this exact expression right here. So let's set this big term equal to the work that the friction will do on it. And work is defined as the force that is being exerted on the object, which in this case is a kinetic friction force, times the distance that the force is exerted over which in this case is d. d is what we want to find, and although we're not given... d is what we want to find, and although we're not actually given the kinetic friction value, we can not expand this a bit, because the force due to friction is of course equal to the coefficient of friction, in this case the coefficient of kinetic friction, which is given to us, times the normal force acting on the object from the surface which is, of course, just m2, the mass of the object, times gravity, g, the acceleration due to gravity. And then, again, it's all multiplied by d. 
From this equation, we can see that these M2s will cancel out. And now to progress even further, let's plug in the formula we got for V2 into the V2 in this formula. So that's 1 half times uh, our formula for V2 squared. So that's times 2 thirds squared, which is 4 ninths, times the square of the square root of 2GH, which is just 2GH. We can see now that these G's will cancel out as per uh, this 2 will cancel out with this 1 half outside here. And now this formula is made up entirely of knowns and the one unknown. So there's the D which we're trying to find. There is 4 ninths which is just a constant obviously. And then for the variables we have H and the coefficient of kinetic friction, both of which are given to us in the problem. So now all that's left to do is to algebraically solve this formula for D by dividing both sides of the equation by mu k. And so we end up with 4 times h divided by 9 times mu k, where h is the height of the ramp and mu sub k is the coefficient of kinetic friction. Now plugging in the two values I have here, to, uh, which is 2.5 meters for h and 0.5 for mu sub k, I find a distance of 2.22 meters. Now for part B, we are dealing with an inelastic collision, specifically a completely inelastic collision, which essentially means that blocks 1 and 2 are going to stick together, basically. Now we started part A with a formula that tells us the final velocity of one of the blocks after the collision, and this formula applies to elastic collisions. Uh, likewise, there is a similar formula for completely inelastic collisions where the final velocity of the block, and I say singular block because they're both basically together now, is equal to m1, the mass on block 1, divided by the sum of both masses, multiplied by the initial speed of block 1. So basically the same formula we had above, except without this 2 in the numerator there. Using a similar method of simplification that we did for part A, uh, once again, you, uh, substituting the square root of 2gh in for the initial speed of block 1, and substituting m2 in for 2 times m1, and simplifying that way, we find that this formula simplifies down to 1 third times the square root of 2gh. Once again, basically the same thing we had earlier, except without this 2 in the top. Similarly, we will once again use a similar method for energy, that we did above, except I'm just going to start off from the simplified point before we plugged in our values, just because we already can see where this is going, fortunately for us. And now let's plug in our formula for V2 in. Once again, the G's cancel out, and the two terms over here cancel out. Just like in the final step of part A, we will solve this for D, and here we get H divided by 9 times mu sub k. Now, once again, you can plug your values in for here. I'm going to use, for me, I'll use the same values we used before that are given by the problem. And we find that the distance in this case is 0 0.55, about 0 0.556 meters. Notice how much shorter this is than the distance we had in the case of an elastic collision. In fact, if you do the math, you'll see that this is, that our inelastic distance is exactly one-fourth of the distance traveled elastically, which makes sense because if you examine our final formulas for the d's here, the only difference is that in the inelastic case, it is lacking the four that was up here in the elastic case. So those are the distances. 